Friday night and time for News Night now on BBC Two with James O'Brien. Once undercover, now under lock and key. Fake Sheikh Mazam Mahmood is jailed for 15 months for tampering with evidence in the collapsed drugs trial of pop star Talisa. And as questions are raised about more trials where he provided evidence, Newsnight speaks to victims of some of his other stings. I can't describe what it was like from the moment that the judge said, send him down. Your mind plays tricks on you. Uh, it, was, it was just, it was a living nightmare. We'll ask one of the tabloid's best known victims if the press still needs to clean up its act. Good evening. The Sun's leader column today was as moralistic as it was unequivocal. Reporters are paid to find stories and check facts. They don't always get it right, but they take pride in trying. Somewhat strange, then, that when it came off the presses this morning, their Sunday edition star reporter, a man already proven to manufacture stories and invent his own facts, was still on the payroll. He isn't anymore. Mazza Mahmood, the so-called fake sheikh of tabloid law, is in jail tonight after receiving a 15-month sentence for conspiring to pervert the course of justice in a case involving the singer Tulisa Contostavlos. That worthy editorial homily, by the way, referred to tweets about refugees posted yesterday by Gary Lineker and other celebrities. The newspaper found no room at all for Mahmoud's misdemeanours. John Sweeney has spent the day with four victims of those stings who were at the Old Bailey to see that sentence handed down. Here is the fake sheikh in his pomp working for the news of the world. And here he is bringing down London's burning star John Alford. The actor served nine months for supplying drugs. Today, the boot was on the other foot. Mazza Mahmood got 15 months for perverting the course of justice when yet another showbiz sting, this time against pop star Tulisa, went wrong. Mazza Mahmood was once one of Britain's most feared journalists. Now he's on his way to prison and it's time for his victims to have their say. These people have one thing in common, their lives were wrecked by the fake shake. Stage hypnotist Jonathan Royal says he was stitched up by Mahmood when he got six months in prison for giving the reporter fake coins. I can't describe what it was like from the moment that the judge said, send him down. Your mind plays tricks on you. Uh, I was, it was just, it was a living nightmare. It, for, uh, it was just, I wouldn't wish it upon my worst enemy. Well, I was put on suicide watch in strange ways. Um, I slept for weeks in prison, fully clothed, scared that what you see in films might happen. People have now started to see that what I've been saying for the past 18 and a half years actually is true. The man is a liar. Another scalp, former world champion boxer Herbie Hyde, who got 22 months for supplying drugs. Mahmoud had so much evidence, so much which he created himself. Like he said, he said, I sent him a text saying that I... I wrote him with a text saying that I've got the cocaine and the match fixing. I cannot spell cocaine. Nevertheless, match fixing. All I, I can't spell them words. Prison, I cried every day. And, and I thought in prison, I might as well kill myself if I want to put this thing to, to, to my family. You know? I'm proud of you. You know, you know what I'm saying? So that, that, that was how I felt. I thought I might as well end it. Another victim, Emma Morgan. Emma, you didn't go to prison. You were a page three girl. What effect did Mazza Mahmood's journalism have on you? Basically, because of the story that went out about me, I lost my home. I lost my job. Um, it wasn't just a job, it was a career. Um, and a career that I think I would have done very well at and it would have lasted quite a long time. He stole that from me. A fourth scalp, John Alford. His career ended in 1999 after Mahmood's sting. 
It was very convenient for the police. The Police and Criminal Evidence Act was put in place to protect us from unscrupulous police officers. They had a very, very, very cosy relationship with the press because they can use lies, trickery and deceit to get a story, which they call subterfuge. Very convenient for them, very damning for us. Their solicitor is calling for an inquiry and she's damning about the conduct of the Metropolitan Police. Corrupt. Corrupt Absolute corruption. Corrupt is a heavy word. It is, and what was going on was very heavy and very serious, but we have uh, evidence of that. I hope finally people will listen to what these men have been saying all along, and I would stress this, there isn't one of those convictions that Mahmoud sustained has not been tainted by his behaviour. Not one. The reporter's victims plan to sue News UK in the civil courts. Today, the company said they would fight those cases and that Mahmood had led scores of successful investigations during his 25-year career with the company, which had led to the exposure of criminality and wrongdoing. For the likes of us and the other people that he stung, I certainly don't feel justice has been done, do you? Not really. No. Mm. No. Um, and as far as not wishing it on my worst enemy, I'm more than happy that Mazza Mahmood is now sat there, quaking in his boots, wondering what's going to happen to him in jail. I'd like to be a fly on the wall. The question now is why do the authorities let these people suffer for so long? Well, joining us now via Skype from France is Max Mosley, the former Formula One boss who was himself the subject of a sting by the news of the world. Since then, he has, of course, campaigned for stronger regulation of the press. Uh, Mr Mosley, the, the somewhat laughable defence now at the beginning of the phone hacking scandal was that it was one rogue reporter. Do you think that actually that description might apply in this case? Well, I think very much so. The, the problem is that news group newspapers, which is The Sun, News of the World, those sort of newspapers, they are, they've been shown to be a criminal enterprise. And now the number one criminal in that group is Mahmoud, has been shown to be exactly what he is. Now, what's absolutely essential from all of this is that we have Leveson Part 2, which is the second part of the Leveson Inquiry, to look at the relationship between the police and the press, and particularly news, news group newspapers. That relationship was utterly corrupt. And just one example of that is that when, uh, I think, the third or fourth investigation into the Daniel murder Morgan was underway, a chief superintendent of Scotland Yard was put under surveillance by a criminal working for the News of the World, using a News of the World van for the surveillance purposes. Now, it's extraordinary that in a civilised society there was no comeback, no investigation into that. Scotland Yard just did nothing. You're and now the time has come when this has got to stop and we've got to show that the police, we've got to expose those elements in the police which are responsible for a really very corrupt system. You'll be aware that Leveson 2 was effectively cancelled by the last Culture Secretary, John Whittingdale. Do you, are you suggesting it might be revivified by, by this case? I think it has to be, because we either accept that we've got a, a corrupt police force with a very corrupt relationship with a major newspaper group. We either accept that and say, well, that's OK, that's fine in England, we'll let that happen. Or we have Leveson to we look into it in detail and root out the elements that were responsible for this. Because personally, I don't want to live in a country where that sort of thing can go on, and I don't think most people do. And you, you've spent just shy, I think, of, of four million pounds on your own, of your own money on bankrolling an organisation that you hope would would police this relationship. What um, what sort of gives you the right to do that? Well, uh, first of all, that is not to poli uh, police the relationship between the police and the press. That is to do with no, the, the behaviour of the press. Uh, I beg pardon. Uh, the, to police the behaviour of the press. The press, exactly. Um, uh, what we're talking about at the moment, and I'll come to that in a, mo in a second. We are short what of time. About, what we're talking about at the moment is the corrupt relationship between the press and the police, and that's a very serious matter. Now, a separate question is whether the press should have a regulator that actually looks at what they do and an independent regulator. And I feel that we need such a regulator, and we particularly need one, because if somebody has 
a case against the press at the moment. Unless they're a millionaire, they can't bring it. Unless you can re risk a million pounds, you can't bring a case in the court. So Leveson won. The first Leveson idea was that we should have an arbitral system so that if you have a complaint against the priest, you go to against the press, you go to cheap, inexpensive arbitration, it gets settled. If the press don't want to do that, if they want to go to expensive high court proceedings, well then they pay. And what the press are doing is they're saying, oh, we've got to pay both sides of the case. But of course, what they're leaving out of that is that that's only if they don't agree to cheap arbitration. Now, access to justice is absolutely vital. 99% of the population can't afford to go to the High Court. In fact, when I said to Lewis and Indian... Well, I, I, I do I understand that, Mr Mosey. I, we, 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 very short of time, I want to ask you one more question with regard to Impress, yeah. the organisation that you're funding. Um, it, it's fair to say that publishers haven't exactly beaten a path to your door, isn't it? Well, certainly publishers like news group, newspapers... Or, or anyone thing, else, they, really. No, well, the last thing they want, or the Daily Mail, just as bad, just as bad as news group, newspapers, the last thing they want is a proper regulator, and they will do everything in their power to make sure there isn't one. On behalf of the rest of the population, I'm going to do my best to see there is one. You don't think Ipso is fit for purpose? I, uh, Ipso is not fit for purpose. It's a completely controlled, financed and... Uh, under the thumb of the large newspapers, which really comes down to four individuals, four billionaires, actually all, all of them tax exiles living, living outside the UK, control 70% of the British press, and somebody calls that a free press. It's laughable. But you think it should be effectively regulated by an organisation bankrolled by another very wealthy individual? No, because the thing is, the fact that somebody pays for it, People have paid for things that the public need through for all generations. That's a perfectly legitimate thing. The difference is I have no control whatsoever over Impress, the pr proposed new regulator. I'm no, reg no control whatsoever. All I do is provide a little bit of money. And that is something the public need. It's a public service. That's why it's charitable. And that's why it needs doing. Max Mosley, many thanks indeed for your time.